The goal of this lecture is to explain the purpose of the human heart, its morphology and related structures and components, and certainly its specific role within the overall cardiovascular system. One thing to keep in mind is in physiology, we talk about the functioning of the human heart at a biochemical and molecular level. We don't do that in human anatomy, but we certainly talk about the function of the human heart. So that's going to be a big component of this lecture. So we will talk about function. We're not going to talk about it once again in the detail or in the minutia that we would within human physiology. But when we talk about anything within human anatomy, we certainly need to consider its role or function within the human body. And with that said, the challenge with teaching human anatomy is a lot of it is done, and I do it myself, in a reductionist manner where we take specific organs or body systems, isolated the, isolate them from other components in the body, and describe their role. And that's tough to do or inaccurate to do, if you will, because every organ system in the body collaborates with a number of other organ systems. So please keep that in mind. So here we have the human heart. We're going to talk about this in detail. The one thing I want to point out in this human heart, the main thing in this depiction, in this image right here, that is inaccurate is this part right here, which is known as the apex. The apex is the most inferior aspect of the human heart. But truthfully, that should be over here to the left. And when I say to the left, I'm speaking of in standard anatomical position. So in standard anatomical position, the apex of the heart is pointed to the left lateral aspect of the human body. And if, we, if you get the opportunity to look at a human cadaver, you'll clearly see that. So this drawing right here is pretty good, but the fact that the apex is pointed directly inferior is somewhat misleading. Give an overview here of the cardiovascular system. Cardio refers to heart, vascular refers to blood vessels. So the cardiovascular system is composed of the heart, blood vessels, and blood. So the only thing of these three that is not embedded within the moniker cardiovascular system is blood. Blood is the medium through which things flow through the blood vessels. So the human heart is merely a pump. And certainly it's more than just a pump. There are receiving chambers in the heart, but the primary purpose of the heart is to create pressure gradients. And we will discuss this at length and where we are trying to push things, where things are trying to be pumped. And that's either to the lungs or throughout the body. So the heart is creating pressure gradients and it's doing so by pumping, which is pretty familiar to all of us. To be clear, the heart does play a part in the endocrine system because it releases a hormone, ANP, atrial natriuretic peptide. But the main role of the heart is its purpose within the cardiovascular system, and that is as a pump. And we're going to elaborate on this fairly extensively during this lecture. The blood vessels are nothing but the conduits or pipes, if you will, that blood is flowing through. And then blood is the medium through which things flow. So blood is composed of water, ions, nutrients, glucose, plasma proteins such as antibodies or albumin. There are a long list of plasma proteins within the blood. Blood cells, otherwise known as formed elements, which are platelets, white blood cells, and red blood cells travel through the blood and gases, oxygen and carbon dioxide. A lot of the discussion in this lecture is going to revolve around oxygen and carbon dioxide. It doesn't necessarily need to be restricted to those, but to keep this initial lecture on the heart on the simpler end of the spectrum, we're going to focus on oxygen and carbon dioxide. Okay, so the, the first question I want to pose is why do we need a cardiovascular system? And the simple answer to that is because the human body is much too large for diffusion to allow for transport of all of the things I mentioned previously. Gases, oxygen, and carbon dioxide, the movement or distribution of nutrients such as glucose throughout the body, the movement of hormones throughout the body, 
Hormones, as you recall, are signaling molecules. They are part of the endocrine system. And hormones would not be able to get throughout the body without the cardiovascular system. So diffusion is the movement of ions or molecules from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. That's what we see in this image right here. In the container on the left, we have the entity here, whether these are ions or molecules, it doesn't matter. And we see to the right, they have diffused to areas of lower concentration. We saw diffusion when we looked at the nervous system. So here we have a neuron releasing its signaling molecule, which is a neurotransmitter. The neurotransmitter travels from the neuron to the cell it is impacting, whether that's another neuron or a muscle cell or a heart cell via the process of diffusion. And it can do that because this space right here or cleft is super, super small. And when I say small, this space between the neuron and this cell is roughly 20 nanometers. A nanometer is a very, 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 very small distance. To put that in perspective, a human hair is approximately 90,000 nanometers. That is to say the width of a human hair is roughly 90,000 nanometers. So because neurotransmitters are traveling a very short distance, they can achieve this movement from point A to point B via the process of diffusion. But when we're talking about hormones and nutrients and gases, they need to spread throughout the whole body. And diffusion, things cannot diffuse super long distances. So that's why we have the cardiovascular system to propel things and perfuse things and move things throughout the body from point A to point B, which could be a very long distance. So let's just take a very basic look at the cardiovascular system. And really what we're looking at here is a component of the circulation known as the systemic circulation. Systemic is suggesting body-wide. So the blood is going everywhere. It's going up to the brain. It's going to the pancreas. It's going to our GI tract. It's going to the big toe. It's perfusing nutrients and gases and hormones throughout the whole body. That is the systemic circulation. Up here at the top, we have the human heart, which looks nothing like this. Leaving the heart in the systemic circulation is going to be an artery, giving rise to arterioles, then to a capillary bed, venules and veins, and back to the heart. The arteries are going to leave the left ventricle. The pump for the systemic circulation is the left ventricle. We are going to outline this very clearly in subsequent images. It's going to pump blood throughout the systemic circulation and exchange of nutrients and gases and waste products at the tissues happen at a region or blood vessels known as capillaries. And we're going to have another video specific to capillaries or excuse me, specific to blood vessels. So don't worry too much about the intricacies of these blood vessels. But when I say the tissues, I am talking anywhere in the body. Once again, it could be the brain. It could be the kidneys, the adrenal glands, the uterus, the bladder. So the systemic circulation is providing oxygen-rich blood to the tissues. And once again, I'm just focusing on gases here. We could be considering glucose or hormones, but really from here forward, I'm really going to refer to the level of gases within the blood, whether it's oxygen-rich or oxygen-poor. This is the systemic circulation, leaving the heart, specifically leaving the left ventricle is the systemic circulation or the beginning of the systemic circulation. And then that circulation goes back to the heart via the venous end of the spectrum. And that is oxygen poor blood. So one thing I want to point out, veins do have oxygen in them. It just has a much, they just have a much lower level of oxygen than arteries. Sometimes you may see that veins are deoxygenated blood, but that's inaccurate. So we will use the term oxygen rich for arteries and oxygen poor for veins. Oxygen rich blood leaves the left ventricle of the heart. 
and returns to the heart. Now oxygen poor blood returns to the heart into the right atrium. So everything I'm showing right here is a reflection of the systemic circulation. The other half of circulation is the pulmonary circulation. And that is the heart in relation to the lungs. So when we talk about oxygen and carbon dioxide, we breathe in oxygen from the atmosphere and we breathe out carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Carbon dioxide is a waste product of cellular respiration. Remember that glucose plus oxygen makes ATP and carbon dioxide is a byproduct of that reaction, as is heat and water, but we're not concerned about those at this point. So we need to get rid of that carbon dioxide and we need to bring in more oxygen. So just a brief preview of the heart. There are four chambers of the heart, the right atrium, the right ventricle, the left atrium, and the left ventricle. As we suggested in the previous image, oxygen poor blood, the venous end of the systemic circulation, returns to the heart into the right atrium. So the right atrium and left atrium are merely receiving chambers. The ventricles are the pumps. The right ventricle is the pump for the pulmonary circulation, as you can see blood going up to the lungs. The left ventricle is the pump for the systemic circulation. Now, it would be wrong for me to say that the atria do not pump. They will contract and push blood into the ventricles, but at a much, much, much smaller scale than the pumping action of the ventricles. That is to say, most of the blood from the atria, atria is plural, atrium is singular, most of the blood, say in this case, from the right atrium to the right ventricle, moves via gravity. It's just falling from the right atrium into the right ventricle, though certainly when the right atrium pumps or contracts, it's going to push the remaining blood in the atria, in the atrium into the right ventricle. So now the right ventricle is the pump for the pulmonary circulation. That is to say it's pumping oxygen poor blood. And that's why I tend to draw veins or venules in blue. Blue is connotating or suggesting oxygen poor blood. That oxygen poor blood is going to be pumped from the right atrium to the lungs via this vessel right here, which is the pulmonary artery. Any time you hear the word artery, that is suggesting a blood vessel is taking blood away from the heart, specifically away from a ventricle. In this case, the pulmonary artery is pumping blood from the right ventricle to the lungs and it's pumping this oxygen poor blood to the lungs so we can get rid of carbon dioxide from our blood and bring in more oxygen into our blood. This is gas exchange at the lungs. To be clear, there is gas exchange at the tissues that we talked about previously. But in that case, let's say the gas exchange is happening at the big toe. Oxygen is leaving the bloodstream through the capillaries and carbon dioxide is moving into the bloodstream. Here we have carbon dioxide leaving the bloodstream into the lungs so it can be breathed out into the atmosphere. And then we are taking oxygen into the blood. That makes the blood oxygen rich that we see right here in red. This is the pulmonary vein. Anytime you hear the word vein, that is suggesting it's taking blood towards the heart. Arteries take blood away from the heart. Veins take blood towards the heart. To be clear, most veins are oxygen poor. Most arteries are oxygen rich, but that's not always the case. And this image right here is one significant exception. That is to say, this is a pulmonary artery taking blood away from the heart, but it's oxygen poor. And this is a vein which is oxygen rich, taking oxygen rich blood back to the heart, dropping it into the left atrium. From the left atrium, blood will move into the left ventricle. And from the left ventricle, blood will leave and move into the systemic circulation. Specifically, it's going to move into the aorta 
which that blood vessel, which is going to distribute blood throughout the whole body, oxygen rich blood. And to be clear, it's not the aorta. The aorta has branches coming off of it. Those have branches coming off of it, going to different areas of the body. One thing I want to be clear in this image, it is not anatomically or spatially correct. The lungs are not above the heart and the pulmonary artery does not leave the right ventricle from that perspective of the heart. So let's get a better perspective on where the heart is in relation to the lungs. Okay, here we have an image of the ventral body cavity. Keep in mind, if we were to divide the body into two general cavities, we would have the ventral body cavity and the dorsal body cavity. The dorsal body cavity, remember, contains the brain and the spinal cord, the cranial cavity and the vertebral canal. Everything else is in the ventral body cavity. And that's what we see right here. Don't worry about all the details on this, but there's in blue, the uterus, the intestines, the stomach, the liver. And then up here, we see the lungs and the heart. To be clear, this red line right here is the diaphragm. And that is separating the thoracic cavity from the abdominal pelvic cavity. So the heart resides in the ventral body cavity. More specifically, it resides in the thoracic cavity. That is the portion of the ventral body cavity that is immediately superior to the diaphragm. And more specifically, the heart resides in a region between the right and left lung known as the mediastinum. Okay, so here's another image of the heart. This is a much better image of the heart. And one reason it's much better is we can see the apex of the heart right here pointed towards the left. Once again, in your image right here, we're looking at this. This is to your right, but we have to think of standard anatomical position. This individual is facing you, making this over here the left side of the heart, and this is the right side of the heart. So the apex is down here pointing to the left, and it is theoretically the most inferior aspect of the heart. And I always say that semester in and semester out as I look at this, is this portion of the heart more inferior than the apex? Maybe. But let's just still consider the apex the most inferior aspect of the heart. And that's somewhat confusing because generally when we think of an apex, we think of a zenith or vertex or point towards the top of something like a pyramid. But for the heart, the apex is the most inferior aspect of the heart. The base is towards the top. So once again, that's a bit confusing as well because we, we tend to think of a base is towards the bottom. So this plane right here is the base of the heart and it has a number of the great vessels coming off of it or moving into it. And my distinction there is that arteries come off of the heart because the blood is leaving the heart via arteries, whereas veins move into the heart because they are bringing blood to the heart. So in this image right here, off the base of the heart, we have this superior vena cava, which is delivering blood back to the right atrium. And to be clear, this right here is the inferior vena cava, which is also bringing blood back to the right atrium. The inferior vena cava is bringing blood back to the right atrium from inferior to the diaphragm. The superior vena cava is returning all blood superior to the diaphragm back to the right atrium. When I say superior, we're thinking the brain and anything within the thoracic cavity. So once again, inferior vena cava, superior vena cava. This right here is the aorta, specifically the aortic arch right here. And that has a number of vessels coming off of the aortic arch that we will talk about in detail in a subsequent video. But this aorta is taking blood away from the heart into the systemic circulation. This right here is the base of the aorta. That's not a chamber of the heart. And blood from the aorta is coming from the left ventricle, which is, which once again is the pump for the systemic circulation. The right ventricle 
is the pump for the pulmonary circulation. And that's going to pump blood into the pulmonary artery. So in the image we saw previously, I had the pulmonary artery leaving somewhere around here in the right ventricle, which is not accurate, but it was a simplified version of this. So from the right ventricle, blood is going to be pumped via the pulmonary artery to the lungs. So here we have it moving to the right lung, and here we have the left pulmonary artery going to the left lung. This aspect or region of the pulmonary artery is known as the pulmonary trunk, until it bifurcates into the right pulmonary artery and left pulmonary artery. The right ventricle is pumping blood through the pulmonary arteries to the lungs so it can drop off carbon dioxide and pick up oxygen. Once that oxygen is picked up, it comes back to the heart via the pulmonary vein into the right atrium. And I'm going to talk about this in even more detail in a subsequent image. I just want to lay out the basic structures of this heart. Superior vena cava, aorta, pulmonary artery, pulmonary vein. Right here we have the aorta. I already told you this was the aorta. So the aorta leaves the left ventricle, wraps around the superior aspect of the heart, moves behind the heart. So we don't see the aorta right here. We're still not seeing the aorta, but then the aorta reveals itself after it passes the heart and it pierces the diaphragm. So now the aorta is going to move into the abdominal cavity. And we'll look at that once again in a su subsequent lecture. A few other things I want to show on this heart in red right here, surrounding the whole heart and going through the interventricular septum. Interventricular because it's between the right ventricle and left ventricle. And truth be known, the septum is created by dense connective tissue, but there's also myocardium right here, which is the heart muscle. So everything in red, pretty much, I'm trying to show as the heart muscle, otherwise known as the myocardium. Here we have valves in red. They are not composed of muscle. And here we have some other valves right here, which are not composed of muscle. But around the perimeter of the heart, we find the myocardium. And the myocardium is much thicker in the ventricles because they require a much stronger and vigorous pumping action. So here we have myocardium, and I'm just showing it here on the right side of the heart. I could, we could be looking at it on the left side of the heart. This is myocardium. Directly on the outside of the myocardium, on the surface of the heart, we are going to find the epicardium. And lining the inside of the heart is the endocardium, Epicar epicardium, myocardium, and endocardium. Okay, so let's take a closer look at the heart right here. Once again, right atrium, right ventricle, left atrium, left ventricle. This right here is not the atria, or excuse me, this is not the ventricle or the right ventricle. This is really the beginning of the pulmonary artery right here. Blood is pushed out the right ventricle through the pulmonary artery, going to the right lung and to the left lung. This right here is also not a chamber of the heart. So I refer to the heart as having four chambers, the two atria and the two ventricles. This is not a chamber either. This right here is the base of the aorta. So this blood right here is being ejected from the left ventricle up into the aorta for the systemic circulation. So this blood is going to move behind this pulmonary artery into the aorta. And to highlight, the aorta is an artery. It's the largest artery in the body. This right here is the pulmonary artery. These are both arteries taking blood away from the heart. One is blue because it's carrying oxygen poor blood from the heart to the lungs, and one is red because it's carrying oxygen-rich blood throughout the whole body. And once again, throughout the whole body, it's taking blood to the brain to perfuse the brain with oxygen-rich blood. It's taking blood to the stomach, to the GI tract, to provide all of the tissue there, all of the cells there with oxygen-rich blood. It's taking the blood to the kidneys to provide oxygen-rich blood to the kidneys. 
certainly the kidneys are also serving a very significant function in filtering the blood, but we'll talk about that in detail when we get to the renal system. So the systemic circulation is taking blood everywhere, providing oxygen to those tissues so they can sustain themselves, so they can make ATP, so they can do work and carry out all the functions they need to, to maintain life as we know it. So one thing I'm going to tell you right now, and don't think too much about this, have it in the back of your head, because we'll, I'm going to deal, detail this later. But in addition to the brain, the GI tract, the big toe, all these other areas, the systemic circulation is also going to be pumping blood to the myocardium, to the heart muscle. And that's significantly important, and we will highlight that. And that's what's known as the coronary circulation. The coronary circulation is providing oxygen-rich blood to the myocardium. That myocardium is a big, strong muscle that requires oxygen, just like our skeletal muscle or our smooth muscle. Okay, so review right atrium, right ventricle, left atrium, left ventricle. The right atrium is a receiving chamber. It's taking, it's receiving blood from the systemic circulation, oxygen poor blood from the superior vena cava and the inferior vena cava. Now to be clear, there's one more vessel that drops blood into the right atrium and that is the coronary sinus. That is not shown in this image. The coronary sinus is delivering oxygen rich blood to the right atrium from the myocardium. I'm gonna say that again. The coronary sinus drops oxygen-poor blood into the right atrium that is coming from the myocardium. So to be clear, throughout the whole body, we deliver oxygen-rich blood to the tissues, and then oxygen-poor blood is taken away from those tissues. Cardiac veins, and I'll talk about this in more detail when we talk about blood vessels, cardiac veins take oxygen-poor blood from the myocardium, drop all that oxygen poor blood into the coronary sinus, which then moves into the right atrium. So the three vessels that drop oxygen poor blood into the right atrium are the superior vena cava, the inferior vena cava, and the coronary sinus. That oxygen poor blood is going to move into the right ventricle, which once again is the pump for the system excuse me, is the pump for the pulmonary circulation. That oxygen-poor blood moves through the right atrium or moves through, moves from the right atrium into the right ventricle through this valve right here, which is known as the tricuspid valve or the atrioventricular valve, specifically the right atrioventricular valve. There is an atrioventricular valve on the left side that we will look at in a second. It's referred to as atrioventricular because it is between an atrium and a ventricle. Atrial ventricular valve, otherwise known as the tricuspid valve. Oxygen poor blood from the right atrium into the right ventricle via the tricuspid valve. When the left ventricle, excuse me, when the right ventricle contracts, it pushes that blood through the pulmonary artery to the lung. That blood is going to return to the heart into the left atrium via the pulmonary veins. Pulmonary veins, once again, are oxygen rich. That's why I have them drawn in red. So this is the right pulmonary vein. This is the left pulmonary vein dropping into the left atrium. The left atrium now has oxygen rich blood that is going to move into the the left atrium has oxygen-rich blood that's going to move into the left ventricle via the left AV valve, the left atrial ventricular valve, known as the bicuspid valve. It's also known as the also known as the mitral valve. That oxygen-rich blood is then ready to be pumped throughout the whole body into the aorta. One thing I want you to notice is the myocardium around the left ventricle is thicker than it is around the right ventricle because as we, we recall where the lungs are, the blood from the right ventricle does not need to travel very far. It's just traveling to the lungs, which are 
immediately lateral to the heart within the mediastinum. So remember those green lungs. Blood does not have, a tr have to travel very far from the right ventricle. But the blood from the left ventricle has to travel all the way up to the brain against gravity, pump all the way down to the big toes, the little toe, to the GI tract, to the bladder, what have you. So the left ventricle is creating much, much more pressure than the right ventricle. And that pressure is what is pushing or propelling blood throughout the systemic circulation. And certainly pressure is propelling blood in the pulmonary circulation as well. So then it pumps through the systemic circulation, comes back to the heart via the inferior vena cava, superior vena cava, the coronary sinus, which would be coming in roughly right around here into the right atrium. Once again, through the tricuspid valve into the right ventricle, up into the pulmonary artery via these valves right here, which is the pulmonary semilunar valve. I'll detail these valves in another lecture, but these valves here, the semilunar valves, prevent backflow of blood into the right ventricle during ventricular diastole. Diastole is relaxation of a heart chamber. And to be clear, the tricuspid valve closes to prevent backflow of blood during ventricular systole. So when the right ventricle contracts, this valve shuts, preventing backflow of blood into the right atrium. We do not want blood flowing from the right ventricle into the right atrium. We also don't want blood flowing from the pulmonary artery back into the right ventricle. And that is the role of the semilunar valve, specifically the pulmonary semilunar valve. And to be clear, the mitral valve right here, otherwise known as the bicuspid valve, prevents backflow of blood from the left ventricle into the left atrium during ventricular contraction, otherwise known as systole. Systole is suggesting contraction. Diastole is relaxation. Those numbers relate to 120 over 80 in blood pressure. 120 is the pressure in the left ventricle during left ventricular contraction. 80 is the pressure in the left ventricle during left ventricular relaxation, systolic over diastolic. And to be clear, that pressure is measured within the brachial artery, not directly in that chamber, the left ventricle, but that's really what it's referring to. So the blood moves through the pulmonary semilunar valve into the pulmonary artery to the lungs, drops off carbon dioxide, picks up oxygen, moves back into the left atrium via the pulmonary vein, moving through the mitral valve into the left ventricle. From the left ventricle, blood is pushed through another set of semilunar valves known as the aortic semilunar valves. So these are representing the aortic semilunar valves, which are at the base of the aorta. So we have two sets of semilunar valves. We have the pulmonary semilunar valve, which is at the base of the pulmonary artery, and the aortic semilunar valve, which is at the base of the aorta. The aortic semilunar valve is preventing backflow of blood into the left ventricle. The pulmonary semilunar valves are preventing backflow of blood into the right ventricle. Left ventricle contracts during the time known as systole. Blood flows through the aortic semilunar valves, through the aorta, into the systemic circulation. That is the basics of the heart. It's a one huge pump. And once again, it's somewhat inaccurate or totally inaccurate for me to say it's just a pump because the atria are receiving chambers as well. And maybe you could even suggest ventricles are receiving chambers because they're receiving blood from the atria. But the purpose of the heart is to get blood to the systemic circulation, provide oxygen-rich blood throughout the whole body, and to get blood to the lungs so we can drop off carbon dioxide and pick up oxygen.
Okay, so what we just looked at in the heart, I talked about pressure gradients a lot, and I want to talk about one dynamic of physics that's universal throughout the world in the whole universe, and that's the relationship between volume and pressure. And it, it is as follows. As volume decreases, pressure increases. And I'm going to be a little more specific with that statement. As the volume of a chamber decreases, pressure within that chamber increases. I am going to offer one very important caveat that the relationship between volume and pressure is not the same when we're talking about fluids or blood. That is to say, when the volume of fluid or blood increases, the pressure increases accordingly. But when we're talking about the chamber, and that's really what I want you to focus on right now, when I'm talking about a chamber, the right ventricle or the left ventricle, so let's just focus on the left ventricle. When the volume of the left ventricle decreases, the pressure within the left ventricle is increasing. That is an inverse relationship. So when we're talking about a chamber, the volume and the pressure, volume and pressure have an inverse relationship. They are moving opposite directions. So once again, when the volume of a chamber, or in this case, this water balloon, when that water balloon's volume decreases, the pressure in that water balloon is going to increase. And that is why when we squeeze on a water balloon, water gets expelled or explodes from the water balloon because we have decreased the volume of the water balloon increase the pressure so much that the pressure inside the water balloon is now greater than the pressure outside the water balloon. That is a pressure gradient. Fluids flow down pressure gradients from an area of high pressure to an area of lower pressure. And that's exactly why the heart pumps or contracts. The left ventricle contracts to make the left ventricle smaller to increase the pressure in the left ventricle ventricle greater than the arterial circulation. That is to say, once the pressure in the left ventricle is greater than in the aorta, blood is going to be ejected from the left ventricle through the aortic semilunar valve into the aorta throughout the whole body. That is pressure gradients. So once again, the size of the chamber, the change in size of the chamber and pressure have an inverse relationship. I want you to keep this in mind when we start talking about pathologies within the cardiovascular system, which impact pressure. Okay, so that's it for this first primer into the functioning of the heart. Here we have the heart. I want to highlight again the apex of the heart that we see here should be pointed to the left. And what I have drawn in red here or highlighted in red, are the coronary arteries. The coronary arteries are coming off the base of the aorta right here. And they are providing oxygen-rich blood to the myocardium, to the heart muscle, so that heart can pump and pump and pump all day long, all week long, your whole life. That heart, theoretically, is never going to stop. Occasionally, it may stop for some people, Hopefully it gets restarted. These coronary arteries, if they become blocked or occluded, is when we have problems with the heart. When a coronary artery becomes occluded, then oxygen is not be being delivered to the myocardium. And if the myocardium doesn't have oxygen, it's not making ATP. If the myocardium doesn't have ATP, it's no longer going to be able to pump or contract. The non-highlighted vessel right here would be a cardiac vein, and that's taking oxygen poor blood from the myocardium back into the coronary sinus, which drops into the right atrium. Okay, more on the heart in a subsequent video.